This evening's scripture is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, on page numbers 848 and 849 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribes said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Greeting, everybody. Good to see you here tonight. Um, I don't know how many of you are parents, but if you're a parent, you will never forget the birth of your children, especially your first child, right? It is one of the most unbelievable uh, experiences, and I'm speaking as a dad. I have no idea what it's like for my wife. Um, but I do remember the day of Gabby's birth. Gabby's my oldest daughter. Uh, I remember all of my children, but, but uh, Gabby's is sort of indelibly etched every single moment of that day. We got to the hospital, I think it was around 6.45 a.m. Michelle had to be induced. Gabby, Michelle's small. Mich- Gabby was getting big, and they put two and two together and said, we can't let this keep going or she's never going to get out of there. So they brought her in, and uh, I remember they, they took us into the room, and they... Um, uh, they, 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 they gave her the Pitocin, and then it was on, right? And the contractions started coming very regularly all throughout that morning. And uh, while I sat on the end of the bed snacking, Michelle was up at the top, you know, groaning in forced labor. And, um, and like clockwork, that Pitocin would hit, right, and they induced the contractions and would steadily build and then subside. It was just awful. I remember seeing the readout, and like, here we go, and back down, here we go, back down. And about three hours into it, the doctors came in and said, okay, let's take a look. So, you know, they do their little check and they say, okay, well, good. You've moved from one centimeters to three centimeters. You got to get to 10, which just, uh, guys, we don't, I don't think we, I don't, I don't even know what to compare this to, but so, so, so she's up to three and they're like, okay, good. We're, we're making some progress. And, and, uh, they come in about an hour or so later and, and, uh, take this big stick and break her water. And I'm like, oh, I mean, everything about this is just awful. And, and, uh, and they said, and they said, you know, it looks like things are going well, except apparently they weren't going well because she stayed at three for like the next 12 hours, went nowhere all day long. Gabby's like a battering ram, just, you know, ramming up and, 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 and Michelle is, you know, sitting there just in pain and not having anything. And all day long, we kept hearing how close we were. Oh, things are going, but she's not quite there. You're close. Just not quite. She's trying, but she's not quite there. And to, you know, I mean, it would have been one of those days, if this has been like the 1950s, I'd have been out in the waiting room going, come on. They come out and go, you know, close, but no cigar. And, and uh, until around 10.30 p.m. that night, okay, so do the math. This has been a long day. And uh, they finally came in and said, hey, we, we got to do something. So they wheel Michelle off. She gets a C-section. That's another story. I won't tell you that. So all day long, she's close, but she needs something else to get her in. Now, Somebody has said that close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, and I didn't know what that mean until I played hand grenades with my former friend. But um, uh, that's what's happening in this passage today, okay? Um, This man that we're reading about comes close, but he's not in. And here's the thing. Uh, I think that's a description of a lot of people that come to church all over America, maybe that's a description of you. You're close, right? 
You've been beaten up against the door. You've been, you've been standing on the porch. You've been standing at the threshold for days, months, some of you years, decades, and, and, and yet you're not in. Some of you think you're in. And I'm not here to be your judge. I don't know who you are, but some of you think you're in. And Jesus would say, you're, you're not far, but you're not in. And uh, because close, this is what's so awful. I mean, this is an amazing passage because close doesn't count in the kingdom of God. I can't think of a worse thing to get to the end of your life and realize all I did was stand at the threshold and I got so used to it, I thought I was in, only to find out you're not. So, so let's just kind of walk through this passage together and, and let's see what we find out, okay, um, as we go along. And, and so I'm going to reread it and I'll stop, pause. And if you're new to Foothill Church, kind of what we do, we just kind of walk through and, and, and listen to what the scriptures tell us. Okay, so verse 28, let's look at it again. One of the scribes came up to him uh, and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, okay, so this scribe he comes up, he hears what's going on. Jesus has had nothing but controversy and conflict since he came to town in Jerusalem. And this scribe looks and goes, you know what? He is really smart. He answers these guys and puts them in their place. And so he walks up to Jesus and says, Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Okay, now, notice a couple things. First of all, the guy's a scribe. What's a scribe? Well, it's kind of like a lawyer, okay? The scribes, the guys, they, they, their job was to interpret the law. Their job was to call ball, balls and strikes, you know. No, that's out of bounds. That's not. This guy's probably this, you know, super smart, seminary prof, written commentaries on, on you know, the first five books of the Bible, whatever, crazy smart. I mean, th this is probably who we're dealing with. But I think this guy is cut from a different cloth because remember, Every, every scribe or man of the law or religious person so far that Jesus has come into contact with, it's been, it's been a horrible conflict. I mean, they've been, they've been sarcastic with him, and Jesus had to put him in their place. But I don't think that's what's happening. There's nothing in here that leads me to believe that this guy is being insincere or trying to trap Jesus like the other people are. Um, I think this guy has an honest question, and he's looking for an honest answer, and he sees and hears something in Jesus that has him intrigued. He seems to like Jesus. He seems to be favorably disposed to Jesus. So he walks up and goes, I wonder how he'd answer this question. Now, what's with the question? This question, which commandment is the greatest? Okay, well, here, you got to understand something. The Jews of that time took took the Old Testament, especially the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and they said, uh, they said uh, there's all these commandments. In fact, they counted them out, and they came up with 613 commandments. And they divided them, actually. They divided them, and they said, okay, there's 365 negative commandments, and there's 248 positive commandments. And they had these questions. They would ask one another quite often is, how do we order these commandments? And they would go from light to heavy, or if you're starting at number one, heavy to light. And so you'd have, you know, maybe the 10 commandments are up here in the first 10, but down here is like, you know, if you got leprosy, make sure you wash. And I mean, so you, they go from heavy to light. And so this is not an uncommon question. And he comes up and goes, okay, Jesus, 613 commands, which one is most important? So, so very common question, nothing unusual uh, about it. Now, now look how Jesus answers, okay? Verse 29 to 31. He says, okay, Jesus answers, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So what Jesus just did, he didn't make this up. He reached back into those 613 laws, and one of those comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's called the Hebrew Shema. Where does that, what does that mean? Shema just means hear. Listen. 
the Hebrew Shema, is because it was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So he's just quoting it, right? It's called the Hebrew Shema. Le- Leviticus 19, 18, and you'll love your neighbor as yourself. So he picks up these two commands and says, these are the most important. In fact, other places like Matthew, he's going to say, on these two, all the law and the prophet hang. Okay? Now, Jesus, by the way, so he says you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. He doesn't mean that you can take a human being and split them into four parts and every part needs to be done. No, we're not like that. The, when the Bible talks about your mind, your heart, your soul, it's not splitting you apart. It's, it's trying to make the point of every part of you needs to love Jesus. Your emotions, your affections. So I think Jesus is saying, look, love God with everything you are. Love him from your head to your toes. Love him with your intellect and strength and decision making and affections, all these things. Let your love for God be all, all all-encompassing. In other words, my love for God ought to outrun every other love in my life. It ought to be bigger than my love for Michelle. It ought to be bigger than my love for my children. It ought to be bigger than my love for the church. It ought to be bigger than anything else in my life. And there needs to be no part of me that is not involved in loving God. That's what Jesus means. That, that's what those passages mean. And then Jesus says... And you need to love your neighbors yourself. That's the second. So there's a first and there's a second. And the second is not the first and the first is not the second. These are are in order for Jesus. Start with God and then you love people. So, So why are they in that order? Because I cannot love anyone the way I should if I don't love God first. And and yet, according to 1 John, I'm a liar if I say I love God and I don't love you. Um, so, so the first is the priority because it will lead to the second. So, so we might say it this way, that, that loving others is the outward objective evidence that in fact I love God. So I mean, there's a whole sermon there. I mean, you gotta look and go, do, do I love others? If I say I love God, is there the fruit of that in loving others? Okay. But, but here's the deal. Jesus didn't just put this guy back on his heels like, whoa, I never heard that. That is revolutionary, Jesus. This is, this is pretty ordinary. And it's especially ordinary to a fellow Jew. I mean, a Jew, a devout Jew would wake up then and today every morning and immediately recite the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They would do this every day. Getting up, going to bed. Okay? They understood it was hugely important. Now, that's not to say that every rabbi would have said certain things. There were some rabbis that said things a little bit differently. But look, it, there's nothing shocking, controversial, earth-shattering, or, or revolutionary about Jesus saying these are the most important. Now, I think most of us would agree with this, right? If you said, you know, I think, I think one of the most important things, we should love God and love our neighbors. We'd all go, yeah, that, that seems intuitively right. And in fact, that's how the man responds, right? Look, look what he says. Keep, keep going. He's like, you said right, Jesus. Well, teacher, I agree with you, <laughs> right? We're not fighting. Wow, right? So you have truly said that he's one and there's no other besides him. And to love him with all of the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, love one neighbor as oneself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. There's no dispute, The guy is happy with Jesus' response. It seems like everything is good until Jesus adds his little comment. Look at verse 34. And Jesus saw that he answered wisely. He likes this guy. This is the first religious leader where he's like, I like you. We can hang out. I'd love to have coffee with you. He says, you answered wisely, but he says this, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now what's going on? See, Jesus is, 
And Jesus is now four for four in his contest with the religious leaders, right? I mean, he hasn't lost one yet. They're all 0 for 4. They have to try a different tactic, and verbal confrontations aren't going to get them anywhere. And from this point on, here's what you're going to notice. Starting with what we look at next week, Jesus sets the agenda. The Pharisees don't come anymore and say, answer me this, answer me that. How about this? What about that? He's just like, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about now. And he does for the rest of the time. Okay, but look again at verse 34. Because I think, okay, as much as we see in this passage, you know, your, your, your Bible probably has verses 28 to 34 set off some way, and it probably says above there the great commandment or the greatest commandment or something like that, the most important commandment. Well, I think it's about that. Please don't hear me saying, I don't think that's important to this passage. It's massively important, but I think the key to this whole passage is verse 34. You're not far from the kingdom of God. So he's saying to this man, look, I like what I'm hearing you say. I like how this interaction is going. I'm applauding you where you are, but you're not far, but you're not in. So this is really good news and some bad news, right? You're near. That's good news. You're not far, but you're not in. That's bad news. I'm sure the guy thought I'm in. See, see, because you've got to be in for it to count. Because close doesn't count in the kingdom of God. So, 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 okay, so what is Jesus when he looks and says, man, you answered wisely. What is Jesus like? What does he hear about what this guy says that would make him affirm? Like, you know, I, I, I like him. Okay. Um, well, think about it this way. The man affirms some really key truths. Now, listen to me very carefully, okay? He affirms, you would say, do you believe this? He'd say, yes. Okay, so listen. What would this man say yes to? I believe. He would say, I believe there is one God. That's huge, by the way. There's one God, not there's multiple gods, this doesn't coexist. He, he really believes there's one God. He, he, he believes that the Bible is true and that, and that we need the Bible to know God. What's the greatest commandment? Because I, I, I live by this thing. He believes that love for God is paramount. Right? I'm in agreement with you, Jesus. This is everything. He believes that there is this ethical dimension to our faith. That is, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Okay, I mean, you see this. He's, he's, he, he believes that affections, the motivations of the heart, are more important than religious ritual, than all the sacrifices. See, that religion is more than mere formalism. He believes that he really wants to be spiritual and not just religious. He doesn't want to just go through the motions. And here's a man that he's a Jew, so he has been surrounded by the covenant community of God's people his entire life. Raised, we could say, in a Christian home. Came to church religiously. And... He likes Jesus a whole lot. He is really favorably inclined toward Jesus. See, so, so there's a ton about this man that Jesus looks and goes, man, I, I commend you. I affirm. I mean, this is good. It, way to go. I'm proud of you. You are so close. You're on the threshold. But you're not in. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that, does that resonate with you at all? Because some of you would go, yeah, I believe in God. And I believe the Bible. And I believe I'm supposed to be, there's this ethical dimension, I'm supposed to be moral. I, I want to be spiritual, not merely religious. I come to church to be around God's people. 
Or maybe you'd even say, I grew up in the church, being surrounded by the covenant community. I really, really like Jesus. I don't want to just go through the motions. Is that you? Then listen. You may be close and not actually in. I mean, oh, you're close, and that's really good news, by the way. That's, that's really good because that's encouraging. There's progress. You're on this journey. God's moving you, but, but, and you're not as far away as some or as you once were, perhaps. But are you in? You see what Jesus is doing here? So the bad news is that you can have all of those things going for you and still be standing on the porch and have stood there for so long that you think this is, this is the kingdom. And my concern is that some of you mistake being close for being in. Now, now look, I, I'm a pastor. I'm not omniscient. I don't know who that is. You do. And some of you think you have, like, you affirm everything we've talked about, but, but you're not in. You're standing on the porch, right? And you've started to think that it's the same thing as being in the house. You think you're in, but Jesus, would he, would he stop you and go, you're not far, but you're not in. Because close isn't the same thing as being in. Do you see this? So what's missing? What is missing from this guy? Why isn't he in? What's going to push this guy and you over the threshold? What would get this guy off of the front porch and into the living room? Well, I, I think this passage, I'm going to show you some things in this passage that I think give us a clue, but I think the real answer lies in what Jesus says next. That is next week. Now, I'm going to deal with it next week, but I want you to look at it with me real quick. Okay, verses 35 to 37, Jesus is quoting Psalm 110. It's called a messianic psalm. Now, listen to what he says. Look at verse 35. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Because everybody knew, there was no dispute that the Messiah was going to come and be the ancestor of King David. That is all, you know, that's, that's Old Testament. It, 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 there was no question. Everybody agreed that's what was happening. So, so then third, verse 36, David himself in the Holy Spirit, that is prompted by the Holy Spirit, writes Psalm 110, if you will. And here's what he writes. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So the Lord, that is God, said to my Lord, that is Christ, sit at my right hand. So here, here's, here's what Jesus is saying. How is this possible? <laughs> How is this possible that this Lord Messiah can be both David's son and David's Lord? How can the Messiah be a descendant and his God? And the answer is that that's Jesus. Jesus is a descendant of David. Look at the genealogies of Matthew. Look at the genealogies of Luke. And he is, Mark told us in the very first verse, the son of God. He can be both David's son and David's Lord. Okay, so in other words, here's what's happening. When Jesus says the greatest command is to love the Lord, he wants to force the question, so who's the Lord? And the answer is Jesus. So what's missing? What's missing from this man? What's missing in some of you? Why is this man, why are you close but not in? Well, let me tell you what I, I think I think we're going to deal with this Lord issue here, but I, I think the first clue is in how this man responds to Jesus. Okay, look at, 
Look at verse 33 again with me, and let me read it maybe with a little more emphasis to help you here. Okay, what has Jesus said? You love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Now look how the man repeats it. You've said right, Jesus. To love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Do you hear what he's doing? It's not really personal to me. I, I, I mean, it's still external. It's generic. It's not specific. It's intellectual, perhaps. It's head, not heart. In other words, this man knows the truth. It's just not his. Okay. But I think what Jesus is showing us then in verses 35 to 37 is what it means to love God is to love Jesus. You hear a lot of people say, like, like it's possible for a Muslim to love God. It's possible for, for a, a Jew to love God. Hear me. Not in this sense it's not. I mean, Luke is going to say very clearly, if you don't love me, Jesus says, then you don't love the one who sent me. Our love is entirely Christocentric. And if we don't love Jesus, the Bible will not give us, will not even let us say we love God. We don't, it's not the same God. So, so, so we have to love Jesus because Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. He's been establishing this throughout the entire book of Mark. So what's missing is not that Jesus is Lord. He is. But that this man, maybe you don't see him that way. See, what's missing from this man is what's missing from some of you is that final decisive act whereby you cross the Rubicon. Remember remember the story of the Rubicon? Right? Who is it? Julius Caesar? Am I getting this right? And he's going to he's going to cross and, and what, 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 what's up with that? Why, why the Rubicon? Because if you looked at it, in, in, in ancient Roman times, you had this river to the north of, of Rome proper, and up above the river, the, the, they said to all these rulers up there that you can have your own kingdoms and you can have your own armies, and we're okay with that. But the moment you cross the Rubicon, you lay down your arms, they are not your army anymore, and you walk in as an, you're now under the rule of the Roman emperor. So what does Caesar do? I'm gonna cross the Rubicon, and there's still my army, and I'm coming for you, Rome. This decisive act. It's that Cortez, you burn the ships. I'm making the decision. This is the point of, in other words, Jesus becomes your Lord. And it starts with you making that decisive choice to follow Jesus. Will you? Will you make that final decision to follow Jesus? Will you place your faith in Jesus? Are, are you in or are you just close? Are your children in or are they just close? See, many of you would say, you know, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'll put my faith in Jesus. I mean, it's like Mark 10. Remember when, when Jesus says to, the, to, to, to James and John, I mean, are you, are, you really, are you really willing to drink the cup that I drink and, you know, be baptized, the baptism I'm, I'm going to be baptized with? And they're like, sure, why not? Seems so easy. But it's not easy. Because genuine faith changes everything. Genuine faith isn't easy. Genuine faith will turn your world, your entire existence upside down, and few people are willing to cross that Rubicon. Maybe they think they have. Because it's too scary, it's too risky. Because l- let, me, let me give you some things about what real faith means for you. Number one 
Real faith means law keeping is no longer your default mechanism. Now here's what I mean. We're almost to the end of chapter 12 in the book of Mark. And Jesus has made it a point time and time again. In fact, the entire Bible makes it a point time and time again to tell you that keeping the law and even doing it perfectly isn't the same thing as genuine faith. And the problem is that our default mechanism, the thing that's almost wired into our heart for spirituality and faith and maturity is law-keeping. So let me tell you how you know this. Just talk to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, right? You begin witnessing to them, you know, tell them, having a conversation. Or you begin talking to somebody who's been, you know, boy, I was raised in the church, but I kind of walked away. You know, I'm kind of de-churched now. I haven't been around for a long time. What will they almost invariably default themselves into they'll you, you'll say you know you begin to, and they'll say you know you're right i need to do better i need to start reading my bible more praying going to church whatever you see it, it, it's it's this default mechanism and you know why you know why you do that you know why i do that because it puts my relationship with God in my control. Because, because it means I can earn God's favor if I just start doing the right things. It means I can right my own wrongs. And it means the cross is completely unnecessary. So what will happen is if you really put your faith in Jesus, law-keeping will come to an end. You'll see it for what it is. And it'll stop being that default mechanism of your heart. That's hard. Let me give you another thing. Number two, real faith means that Jesus is now Lord. Okay, you can underscore that as many times as you want. Lord of your life. That's real easy to say. Completely different to do. In other words, you relinquish control. You cross the Rubicon, Rubicon but under, uh, uh, unlike Julius Caesar, you, you cross and you do lay down your arms and you, you do give up all authority and you do say, I'm here under another king. You surrender to the king of the kingdom. And it means you now have a new functional center of your life that has a right to control everything. And that new functional center isn't you, and it's not something else, and it's not your job, and it's not a a relationship. That new functional center is Jesus, period. He calls the shots. He gets to call balls and strikes. He determines what you will and will not do. Now, is that risky? Yes, oh, holy cow, that's risky. Is it worth it? Oh, yes. Because, look, it's risky because you don't know what you're getting into. It's worth it because you do know who you're getting into it with. (laughs) You're walking into relationship with the Lord, with the one that Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, know therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. That's the God you're walking into this relationship with. See, see, that's the God you're serving. Is it risky? Yeah, because I mean, look, he has total authority. Tim Keller, one of my favorite pastors, is a pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian in, in New York City, and, and, and he tells a story of he's, he's, he's preaching on the totally free, undeserved, unmerited grace of God that saves you. You did nothing. God did it all. God saved you. Completely unmerited. You added nothing to this equation. And he says this very bright young woman 
walks up to me afterwards, really thoughtful, and she says to Tim Keller, she says, I got a question, or really a comment. She says, if I'm really saved totally by grace, I have a problem with that. (laughs) And Tim Keller says, why? And very, very astutely, she responds, because if that's true, then there's nothing, there's nothing that he can't require of me. Do you see what she just said? And she, she was brilliant. She realized that, you know, the good part about being a law keeper is I can go, hey God, remember I did that for you, so sorry, you can't ask me to do that. That's too far. But if it really is undeserved, totally unmerited grace of God that saved you and me, he can ask you whatever he wants. He's your authority. You see this? This is not easy. Real faith is I give up. But then number three, real faith in Jesus will expose the vertical nature of your sin. Okay, now, now, now listen to me carefully because I don't, I don't know how many of us really grasp this, not because we're, we're not smart. I, I just don't think we think this way. Like, like look, I, I think most of us know we're jacked up. I, I know that about myself, right? I, it, it's, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist. Anybody who is even remotely religious who, th- I mean, th- looks at themselves and goes, I got problems, I don't know anybody who goes, yep, don't have any sin, I'm perfect. I, I, you know, most people, if they have any amount of self-reflection, can look at their lives and realize they're sinners. So you, what do they say? You'll hear people say, well, yeah, I'm not perfect, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm not perfect. Amen, you're not. I'm not either. So we know. We all have a sense of sin. But that sense of sin, follow me here, is completely horizontal. So, so look, I, I see my sin as being against Michelle or my kids or you or that jerk in the car next to me. I'm not perfect. I sin. I get mad at people. I get impatient. Words come out of my mouth that I wish hadn't come out. I'm not perfect. And what completely escapes us, what completely escapes us is that our sin is against God. Vertical. You see this? Our sin is horrific first and foremost because it is against God. So like David, what does he do? David sins against Bathsheba. He sins against her husband Uriah. He sins against the commander of his army. He sins against the armies of Israel. And yet when Nathan the prophet comes and confronts David with his sin and tells him, you did all these things, you're horrible. What does David say in Psalm 51? Against you, God, and you only have I sinned. See, see, everyone gets they're not perfect. But if you come to Christ and you cross the threshold, you'll see more than that. Because you will come going, I don't deserve to be in your presence. Forgive me, God. And when you do, what are you doing? You're acknowledging that you're sinning against him and him alone. Right? I have offended God. I don't have to simply try and smooth things over with Michelle or my kids or you or whatever. I've sinned against God. I'm accountable to him. We don't think like this. You know, if you ever seen the movie, there's this movie called Get Low with, uh, I think it's Bill Murray and Robert Duvall and some others. And, and Robert Duvall is this kind of, you know, hermit and he's trying to run away from things and I won't give away the whole story. But in his, and at one point in the story, just to kind of cut to the chase here, he, he's sitting on the side of the road. The storm is, you know, pounding down on him and, and he's trying to come to grips with his past. There's something that's happened in his past that we don't really know. And he's trying to come to grips with this and he says this. All these people are giving advice. He says this. They keep talking about forgiveness. Ask Jesus 
for forgiveness, they say. And then he says this, I never did nothing to him. That's, that's our attitude. I never did nothing to Jesus. Oh, but you did. Everything you ever did was against Jesus. Because if you didn't, then there's no reason for the cross. Jesus died a horrific death for nothing. Your sin nailed him to the cross. That's the Bible, for the sins of the whole world. That, that's me, that's you. So, so you must not only deal with people that you sin, that sin against you, and that you sin against, you must reckon with the one who made you, who has a right over you. See, this is why it's the Rubicon. This is why this is a point of no return. Because everything changes. You give him everything. You put him in charge of everything. You surrender to his will. You lay down your rights. So it's not easy. And you know, you know what the irony of this passage is? Oh, it's, all, it's, it's the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the irony. No one loves like that. <laughs> None of us. That's impossible. That is impossible. And that's the point. Because the only way I'm going to cross that threshold by loving God like that is by going, the only one who's ever done that is Jesus. He, he did love the Lord God with all his heart, mind, soul, strength. He did perfectly love his neighbor as himself. And he died so that because I couldn't and he could, and I place my faith in him. Now God, this Bible, had, the Bible has this incredible truth called the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So now I say, yes, I believe in what Christ has done. I can't earn it. I can't get it. I can't love like that. I can't stir up this love that I don't have. And he says, well, then you just, you just trust in Jesus. You place your faith. You let it turn your world upside down. And you run to him, and you take shelter under the wings of Christ, and, and you'll cross the Rubicon. See, see, the scribe had all the right answers. Some of you have all the right answers, but he was missing faith in Jesus. He was missing trust in the only one who could make him right in God's eyes. And this is why we have to cross, because look, if this man can cross the threshold on his own, if, if you can do that on your own, then the cross is meaningless. And the reason he's close but not in is he still needs the cross. He still needs to realize the only way he gets in is through Jesus, not law-keeping. And the reason you're not in is because you think maybe I'll get there on my own. I'll get to my death. I'll have earned it. My good will outweigh my bad. I believe all the right things. But I've never just said, yes, I trust in what Christ has done. See, you need the death of Christ in your place for your sin as the only means of giving you access to the kingdom, of stepping across the threshold so you're not far. Congratulations. Some of you are not far. You've been on this great journey with Christ, but you're not in. You're making progress. You're wrestling with hard questions. You're close, but you're not in. But others in this room, you think you're in. That's the most dangerous place of all, and you're not. You've stood on the porch for years. 
and it's time to cross, right? It's time to place your faith in Jesus. It's time to say the decision is now. Say, (laughs) I wonder how many people will be standing on the porch when Christ returns. How many people will be standing on the porch? And it's no longer Jesus saying to you, oh, you're not far. His words are going to be, you're not in. And it's over. See, if if you've not done that, this is no no joke. We don't dance around the truth and kind of, push up against the truth and rub up against truth. We we embrace the truth and we cross the Rubicon and say yes. And if you're here today and you don't see a decisive moment in your life where you crossed and it changed everything, I'm pleading with you today. Don't go one more day. Don't be standing on the porch when Jesus comes. None of you ever want to hear him say, you're not far, but you're not in. Let's pray. Father, you are so kind and compassionate that you would give us chance time after time after time after time. And God, you're rejoicing. There are people in here that are so much closer than they used to be. They are are standing, as it were, at the threshold, but they've not made that final decision based upon the cross of Christ and saying, I place my faith in Jesus. I'm going to stop trying to use law-keeping and place my faith in Jesus. You will become my authority. I will bow my knee to your authority. I'm going to see that my sin, I am ultimately accountable to God for my sin. And it will change everything. God, help people today. If there are those who have deceived themselves into believing they're in but they're not, oh God, I pray, open blind eyes today. Let them see their real situation. God, I pray against, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to scare anybody. God, I pray that instead reality would rule. Truth would rule. We would come to a knowledge of the truth about ourselves right now. And if there are people who have not crossed that threshold, Father, let today be the day. They don't have to go one more day. They don't have to wonder. They can know and they can know fully. I'm not far. I'm in. I'm in. God, do that today, I pray. We love you. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.